Hello, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast about old books, ancient world, and whatever we feel like talking about. My name is Thomas Magby. I'm joined, as always, by Mr. A.J. Hannenberg. Howdy. And Mr. Graham Donaldson. Hello. And, you know, I, I said some things that we cover in our podcast. What I didn't mention is that we are huge fans of talking about parenting tips as well. And so today, <laughs> we are going to talk about A.J.'s favorite expert on how to raise children well, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Now, personally, I'm very excited. You're not actually talking about Amelie or Emily no. or however it's pronounced. Are you? Although I should, I should have switched. I should have talked about that book instead. What a way to start out 30 seconds in saying you should have done another <laughs> book. We haven't even gotten into the one you prepared for today. Well, fair enough. And that's been today's episode. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. This is, I'm, I'm doing his most influential book. So this is probably the one I should do. But okay. I am interested in his child rearing stuff. So I am talking about Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, which sounds French, but he's from Geneva. Right? Where's Geneva? Switzerland. Switzerland. Switzerland? Yeah. So he's see French there. Fair. Yeah, okay. They, they use Swiss francs. That's true. Uh, nailing it so far. <laughs> <laughs> so he also wrote some other books about child rearing, which is what Thomas was referencing in his introduction, and we will maybe get to that. So Jean-Jacques like Rousseau. Send your kid to an orphanage. Isn't that his advice? No, well, that's what he did. That's no. what he did. Well, I think it's kind <laughs> of Is it also his advice? Well, it's more like a totally hands-off approach. Like it just doesn't, like don't mess with them, like let them kind of develop naturally. I've seen kids like that. And how have they turned out? They're the paragons of virtue. <laughs> Didn't yeah. they do a social experiment with a kid who was like completely neglected like that and basically grew up feral? Probably. I don't know if it was an experiment. Yeah. Just like there are just feral. feral children. It's usually a thing around like language development, whether you can still learn language if you haven't learned it when you're young. Oh, interesting. There's, still, there's some stuff around that. Can you? I think the answer is yes. Because oh. you have parts of your brain. You have your vernica and your broca's region that are around language use and... and uh, speech so that's just natural to a person let's talk about cool the just, brain today man. hi guys Maybe I'm gonna, right. my name is thomas Magby. i'm gonna start talking about brains. so i'll give you a little bit of history of the guy and then i will give you part of the social contract today we're not gonna do the whole thing but we'll do most of book one and a small chunk of book two and then if we have time we can maybe try to head a little further into book two but I think we'll, I think that'll be probably enough for an episode. So he was born in Geneva, a then city state and the seat of Calvinism. He was proud that his family had voting rights in the city and he signed his books, Jean Jacques Rousseau, citizen of Geneva, which is pretty fun. That's fun. Um, during that time, it was essentially an oligarchy and his dad was a watchmaker and his mom was from the upper crust, but he was raised by an uncle, uncle who was a Calvinist preacher. Um, so he wasn't even raised by his parents. Hmm. Yeah, not really. Hmm. I mean, yeah, not really. So in 1965, his mom had to answer charges that she was attending a street theater disguised as a peasant woman so she could gaze on Monsieur Vincent Saracen, who was married, but who she had a crush on anyway. Uh, after the hearing, <laughs> the public hearing about this, she was told to never interact with him again. So she married Rousseau's Wait, dad. Just to go look at him? I mean, she, she wanted to gaze at him. Oh, wow. Man, that is Calvin. Calvinist. <laughs> <laughs> go, to, go to theater to gaze at somebody. Um, so she married Rousseau's dad at the age of 31. Her brother had married his sister eight years earlier in a shotgun wedding. Oh. Um, and the child died at birth. Rousseau wasn't told any of this and believed that young love had been denied by a disapproving patriarch, but later prevailed, resulting in two marriages on the same day. Nope, that's not what happened, and he never really learned the truth about how his parents and and, and uncle got together. Um, His brother and he were raised mostly by his dad and a paternal aunt, um, depending on when you're talking about. So at one point in his early life, he went to live in an area of artisans and workmen rather than the high society, you know, like people that made art. And he liked it better than living with rich artists. Um, And... While there, he's like, yeah, I like the people that make things with their hands, and I don't like all this useless art that everyone is making. And at, during that time, his dad got into a kerfuffle with a wealthy landowner who caught him trespassing, so they moved away to Nyon. Um, his dad remarried, and Rousseau then saw little of him, so he went to live with his maternal uncle, who went to board for two years with a Calvinist minister in a hamlet outside Geneva. And during this time, he dreamed of maybe becoming a minister, right? He became really devout in Calvinism. Um... And then at some point during this time, he apprenticed to a notary who beat him. Uh, So at 15, he ran away from Geneva and then took shelter in Savoy with a Roman Catholic priest and was introduced to Francois-Louise de Warrens, who was 29, and she was a noblewoman who was also a lay prosecutor. He converted to Catholicism 
and then sure. would later revert back to Calvinism. But for her, I guess I, I, I assume. Yeah. And at this point, teenage Rousseau was generally on his own, like after running away, he was kind of doing his own thing. Um, and he did odd jobs and lived with de Warrens for a good chunk of that period. Right. When he had converted to Roman Catholicism and she had like, they eventually became lovers, her and him, even though she was much older while she was also intimate with the steward of her house, which was confusing for yeah, Rousseau, sure. right? Because they had this weird love triangle thing happening, but he just sort of dealt with it because he loved he loved her. And she, um, despite this weird love triangle business, basically ignited in him a love of learning. She loved to entertain, to read, to listen to music, to bring people over, to discuss big ideas. And so this is what sort of ignited in him the passion for education. In 1742, he moved to Paris with an idea for a new musical notation system, right? So instead of the, the, the bass scale. clef and the treble yeah. clef and the scale we have, he, I think it was just one line gotta go. with a whole bunch of symbols on it. And he brought it and they were like, that is cool. And we see that you're smart, but no, we're not. <laughs> That's not <laughs> yeah, going to no happen. Way. And so he got rejected and it didn't work. Um, and he took another lover while there who bore him several children, all of whom he gave up to a foundling hospital, right. which is ironic considering his works on how to raise children. So he had a lot of kids, I think four maybe, and almost all he gave up to be raised by somebody else. Um, he wrote essays and music and one essay about how the arts and sciences had led to the degradation of mankind gained him fame, as well as an opera he wrote and performed for the king that earned him a king's pension. The king was like, I will pay you forever. And he turned it down. Well, wow. Right? Kind of cool. Why? Um, I don't know. Huh. Did was, he, was he singing in the opera or just wrote it? He just wrote it, I think. Hmm. And the king said, I'm going to pay you for life. And he was like... I wonder if it was like a job. Was oh. he being paid to oh. do something for the rest of his life? I don't know. It may have been, yeah, come be my composer or he something. He didn't want to sell out for the there, man. Yeah, there's got to be some sort of hooks, hooks in it that he wanted to turn down. Right. I wish I knew more about it. It's hardcore. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's so metal. <laughs> metal that he turned down a king's pension? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, I can see that. He's talking to the man, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. He sure. returned to Geneva in 1754, reverted to Calvinism, and regained citizenship, and found another lady, the 25-year-old Sophie Dudetot. Um, at this point, he had kind of had a break with Diderot, who's a longtime friend. Do you know anything about Diderot? Just the name. Yeah, I just know the name. I'm not sure I know much about him. And he wrote a bunch of his major works during this time and affirmed the spiritual o origin of the soul and the universe, oh. which contradicted the materialism of Diderot. So Diderot was materialist. He was like, yes, soul. That's great. Got one of those. That's going to make the friendship awkward. The, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it will. And I think it, what, Diderot also accused him of stealing his ideas mm. and publishing them on his own. That's also going to make the friendship awkward. Yeah, they didn't. It Not wasn't great. that great. Um, his book, Emily caused issues and Rousse <laughs> and Rousseau, cause in it, he advocated for universalist attitudes, which is each religion is just as good, but you should stay with the one you were born in. You know, if you were born in one, then just hang out. Okay. But you know, it's not better than any, any others. This caused public condemnation, the banning and burning of his books and some war warrants issued for his arrest. Oh. Um, he was condemned by both France and Switzerland. And so he appealed to King Frederick of or King Frederick the Great of Prussia. He said that he'd been critical of him in the past and that he probably would still be critical, but that the king could do it with him what he liked. <laughs> so he's like, look, man, I know I said some things about you. I'm probably still going to do that, but hey, whatever, you can do with me what you want. I can't live where I'm living. And so the king sent this back, and I have it verbatim. We must succor this poor unfortunate. His only offense is to have strange opinions, which he thinks are good ones. <laughs> I will send him, I will send a hundred crowns from which you will be kind enough to give him as much as he needs. I think we'll, he will accept them in kind more readily than in cash. If we were not at war, if we were not ruined, I would build him a hermitage with a garden where he could live as I believe our first fathers did. I think poor Rousseau, Rousseau has missed his vocation. He was obviously born to be a famous anchorite, a desert father, celebrated for his austerities and flagellations. I conclude that the morals of your savage are as pure as his mind is illogical. <laughs> Just like if, if we weren't at war, I'd build you like a shack in the woods and send you there. He's he's kind of like a romantic idiot yeah, is the, right. way, the way I think King Frederick saw him. Um, the locals caught wind of his opinions and tried to bring him up on charges of blasphemy. His own pastor denounced him as the Antichrist. The parishioners were inflamed and they pelted him with stones when he would go for walks. 
Um, so he went out to live on a solitary island with permission in Bern, where he'd been ex- he'd been expelled from there before. And so he's like, look, man, I want to come live on an island. They said, okay, you can come back and live, but no funny business. Uh, so and then about, and about a month later, they decided to say, all right, that's enough. You got to get out of here. Um, even though he offered to be <laughs> to be incarcerated and basically live at his own expense under house arrest in this place. And they're like, nope, you got to go. And I think they even shortened the date. They said, you have to leave. And he said, I want, I will, I'm willing to stay even under duress. And they're like, okay, you have to leave tomorrow. <laughs> um, <laughs> he was, hey, uh, go of it. This poor guy. Yeah, I know. He was invited by many to come and live with them, and he accepted David Hume's invitation. And I think he went to live in the UK. I mean, we shouldn't feel too sorry for Rousseau. He was also like, he would expose himself to people in the streets and stuff. So can you tell us more about that? So I know that... Well, he would like, he has these famous stories, whether they're true or not, that he tells in his autobiography about him like, going to the sewers, and people are coming by, and he's like, just had the sudden desire to like run around naked, and like, he's, he's a creepy dude. Rousseau. He's Wait, weird. so he's what about the sewers? Like, he would just go down in the, the sewers? Yeah, there. Oh, shoot. I mean, I can't remember the story, and now we're going to get YouTubed. Uh, but there there was a... Like what, a wait, what does it mean to get YouTubed? Oh, someone's going to... Some very like, nice person is going to tell us... It's going to well story, actually which, us in the comments. Which we'll, we can then correct ourselves later. Which, <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing. Like the plug No, it's true. Yeah. But um, uh, the, part of his, his story, he was, like, arrested because he was, like, exposing himself to people. I think he said he was going to, like, have a tryst with the lady in the, an alley... And then she didn't show up and, or she, she, he thought she was showing up and it was a cop and he like took his clothes off and anyway. Oh gosh. So Russo is like, he's a pretty sketchy guy. Okay. Yeah. So I he, mean. He's a romantic. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. So. I'm trying to look this stuff up. And I'm, I'm, I'm still looking. So while he was living with Hume, both Diderot and Rousseau wanted to reconcile, but neither would make the first move. They were like, hey, man, we could be friends again. He's like, but I'm not going to do it. He's like, well, I'm not going to do it. You still believe in the eternal soul? Yeah, so they, they wouldn't do that. He eventually moved away from Hume's place to another house. And then the two quarreled because of some things that Hume had done, but perhaps done without ill intent. So maybe he offended Rousseau, but it wasn't on purpose. And then they had a very public falling out in which Hume published his side of the story on what had happened between the two. And so everything kind of went south for Rousseau. Again, I don't know how it could go more south, but it is more south. And he returned to France under an assumed name, but was, of course, soon found out. He suffered from paranoia and anxiety about people trying to destroy him. And they kind of were. They even blamed him and accused him of burning down a theater, which I don't think he did. Hmm. Um, He married a woman named Therese and worked on his confessions, which would be published posthumously. He eventually died from brain problems and... It resulted from multiple falls, the first of which is pretty fun. There was a carriage coming one way and a giant Great Dane going the other way, and he couldn't avoid them both. So in the street, he decided to get hit by the Great Dane, and it knocked him down and bonked his head, and then he continuously kind of fell after that, and it mm, just sort mm, of degraded guy. into death. a big dog. That's a... Death. I mean, those are big dogs. All right, so that's, that's uh, Rousseau. Crazy. Whew. Guy had a life. Had a life. I think Graham is correct in the thing that he was saying before he, that he is sketchy yeah he 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 it's writes in confessions of, he writes of himself that he exposed himself and i don't i don't really want to read the quote but that's a thing that happened apparently so there you go gross yeah so he's a i'm glad we're doing an episode on this guy yeah well the reason i'm doing an episode is because his thought had a big influence on the oh we live in a russo world right now uh, why R- do you say that Donaldson? i mean so he is Well, I'm assuming what you're going to be talking about is he merges kind of this burgeoning romanticism and political thought and his idea of the noble savage and that um, that society imposes limits on people and society imposes rules when our natural impulses of freedom are the purest way to live. And society comes and puts hindrances on those freedoms, which is an understandable position to come from if you grew up in Geneva, Uh, if you grew up, you know, in but um, um, the idea that, like, there is no original sin, that humanity in its basest form is sort of noble. That's where, he, he, that's where mm-hmm. we get the noble savage idea from, okay. is that humanity in its basest form is pure and good and will organize themselves in pure and good ways. And then as soon as you get higher orders of civilization, higher orders of government, then you're going to be introducing problems. And um, that 
sort of rom- that's that's the merging of this sort of romantic individualism and like political theory. So that's why he's why, why I say we live in a, in a that's that's weird. It seems world. to run directly contrary to what he's saying in the book that I'm reading. Except for the what you're what's, what's the first sentence of the book that you're reading? Man, uh, is, man is born free, and everywhere he, he is, is in chains. chains. So I, but that <clears> is <throat> Graham's point that there is a nobility, a freedom to man in his natural state, and we are oppressed is not the word he would use, but we are forced into acting a certain way by society around us. And that's a part of social contract. Mm. Have you read social contract? Yes. But also the, even the idea, I think this is part of what Graham's getting at the idea that we as individuals enter into a social contract as opposed to it being something that, um, predates us or that we don't really have a choice in, but we just have to be a part of that. Individualism is also a part of modernity that I think is a part of what Graham is getting at. Mm. Though you, again, you've read it more recently than I have. I will be curious as to what very different conclusions you get to. All right. Well, there's, there's one section where he talks about the good that society brings to man, not that society imposes all these rules and we should rebel against it, but that society is, it, it seems like as I read so far, society, at least the social contract we enter into is a good, a good thing. Right. We gain things from that social contract, but we do give up certain freedoms. Again, yeah. that, that's the, that's um, expressed in that first line as well. Okay, great. So let's, uh, let's kind of take it step by step. I'm sure we're going to get waylaid somewhere, somewhere here. In that. And honestly, I hope so. That's kind of the point of this one. So, you know, when I do philosophy, I, I'm hoping we get into some, you know, some hairy territory. Okay. So again, the first line of the book that he mentioned, it, it is now famous. Man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. One thinks of himself the master of others and still remains a greater slave than they. How did this change come about? I do not know. And what can make it legitimate? That question, I think I can answer. So this is what kind of what he's setting out to do. Um, the next, that, that's section one, the subject of this book. Section two is the first societies. And he says that the model of the first society is the family. Right? <laughs> Really? Graham is laughing laughing because he abandoned his children. Yes, because he abandoned his family and, like, was a philanderer and an adulterer. Sure, but uh, what is that? That's uh, too quoque. It it doesn't doesn't negate the stuff that he says. Fair enough. Right? Um, But, yeah, the only one that is natural is the family. And even so, the children remain attached to the father only so long as they need him Hmm. for their preservation. Uh, as soon as you have these fancy orphanages and <laughs> all their needs are taken care of. As soon as this need ceases, the natural bond is dissolved. There you the go. children released from the obedience they owe to the father and the father released from the care he owed to his children return equally to independence. If they remain united, they, they continue so no longer naturally, but voluntarily. And the fam- family itself is then maintained only by convention. So he says, this is kind of the model of what we are doing in society is that we kind of band together for our own preservation. And then once that necessity for preservation is gone, it's just convention after that, then it's convention. Right. And we kind of move on. So that's kind of where he begins things. Um, he also addresses some, some side notions by Aristotle and I don't think we need to hang out there. And so he's kind of, I think in the the first part of the book, addressing other ideas of society. So one of the first ones he addresses is the right of the strongest. So, Might makes right. If I am strong enough, I get to say what it is right for man to do, right? Do you guys, have you guys heard of this as a convention for government? Yeah. I mean, not far off from our Nietzsche episode one week ago. Exactly. Um, He says that's ridiculous, right? Because if I am being forced to obey, the moment I can disobey with impunity, you will, I will. And I am therefore right, right? So basically the adding right to it makes Mm. no difference, right? It it is a non-entity in this. I am only under obligation when I'm under force. And the moment I can disobey and get away with it, I am therefore right. So there is, I mean, there's no reason to add a moral thing to this. And as soon as you are disobeyed, all of a sudden your moral structure is negated, right? So it's kind of a silly thing to say that, you know, morality or right comes from force. Sure. Does that make sense? Yes. You guys on board so far? Yes. Okay. And then he kind of says that slavery too is a ridiculous social convention, which is pretty cool coming as he was in 1750 or so. Graham is, Graham is unimpressed. Was that a shrug? Well, I mean, well, what's his re- reason? I mean, I mean, I mean, he gives many. Yeah. Um, 
one of he he spends a lot of time talking about I mean this is this is slavery not as we would think of it probably in the US but this is slavery as it existed for most of the ancient world which was you are enslaved if you lose a war and you aren't willing to die for your country right if you lose and the guy says listen you can be my slave rather than me kill you and you say all right that sounds like a better deal than dying. than dying today then you become enslaved right and that was how slavery kind of worked back in the day and he said that's kind of a ridiculous thing he spends a lot of time talking about how you don't actually have the right to kill that guy because the war isn't between individuals, but between states, and you can overthrow their state without killing that guy, right? You can win and not have to kill that guy. Yeah, kill other guys, though. And, sure, and you are, you are, instead of just killing him straight, you are killing him usefully. You're essentially taking away from him everything that makes him a man. Um, and there's no... Oh, by making him a slave? Yes. Yeah, and there's no convention. Basically, you're, you're not entering into an agreement or anything because you have taken all of his rights away from him. And so there's no... Like, you're not actually in any sort of governing agreement. It just becomes a might, might makes right thing again. And we've already shown that might makes right doesn't really work. Okay. So we're still sort of in the preliminaries here. Um, and then he says, we must always go back to a first convention. And that convention is, drum roll, brrr, the social compact. And the social... Contract. It says compact. I'm just here. making sure. Yep. Um, so the social compact, which is funny because the name of the book is the social contract. I don't know if they're switching it up or, you know, flip-flopping on that. But he basically says, here is... Here's what's going on. Here's the, the notion of it. And so I'm going to read this little section because I think it's central to pretty much the whole book. He kind of lays out what's, what's up. Um, let's see. I'll find my spot to start reading. Let's just start reading at the beginning of six. I suppose men to have reached the point at which the obstacles in the way of their preservation in the state of nature show their power of resistance to be greater than the resources at the disposal of each individual for his maintenance in the state. Meaning, it's hard to live out there, right? You are at the, like, man is at the point where you cannot overcome nature's stuff against you, so you have to get together with other people, right? So society is maintained by need. C.S. Lewis talks about this in The Great Divorce, right? Need is what makes us band together as people, otherwise we would just live off on our own, probably. And it's too hard to be completely self-sufficient. Exactly. Like, yeah, it's too dangerous. Right. Okay. So for your independence, it's better to be with people. So then he says, that primitive condition can then subsist no longer and the human race would perish unless it changed its manner of existence. But as men cannot engender new forces, but only unite and direct existing ones, they have no other means of preserving themselves than the formation by aggregation of a sum of forces great enough to overcome the resistance. These they have to bring into play by means of a single motive power and cause to act in concert. So we got to come together. This sum of forces can only can arise only when several persons come together. But as the force and liberty of each man are the chief instruments of his self-preservation, how can he pledge them without harming his own interests and neglecting the care he owes to himself? This difficulty and its bearing on my present subject may be stated in the following terms. Um, Let's see. I wonder if I can skip this, but this section. No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, the problem is to find a form of association which will defend and protect the whole common force, the person and goods of each associate, and in which each, while uniting himself with all, may still obey himself alone and remain as free as before. That is the fundamental problem of which the social contract provides the solution. So how do you do this while remaining free? The clauses of this contract are so determined by the nature of the act that the slightest modification would make them vain and ineffective, so that, although they have perhaps never been formally set forth, they are everywhere the same, and everywhere tacitly admitted and recognized, until, on the violation of the social compact, each regains his original rights and resumes his natural liberty, while losing the conventional liberty in favor of which he renounced it. These clauses, properly understood, may be reduced to one. So here it is. It's the total alienation of each associate, together with all his rights, to the whole community. For, in the first place, as each gives himself absolutely, the conditions are the same for all. And this being so, no one has any interest in making them burdensome to the others. So he alienates himself, basically gives up his rights, right? Right? unconditionally to the whole. 
and the, everyone else does the exact same thing or else this wouldn't work. So I guess in the podcast, we give up our, the, the time it takes to come together to make this podcast, right? It is advantageous for us all to do so. We could probably, we could maybe produce a podcast on our own, but it might not be quite as good, right? So that's kind of what's happening with society. So, so like the hang together or we'll hang separately kind of thing? Yeah, exactly. Um, moreover, the alienation being without reserve, the union is as perfect as it can be, and no associate has anything more to demand. For if the individuals retained certain rights, there would be no common superior to decide between them and the public. Each being on one point his own judge, would ask to be so on all. The state of nature would thus continue and the association would necessarily become inoperative or tyrannical. So you have to give everything or else it doesn't work, right? If you reserve something where you're like, this is my right and I'm separate from whatever you guys got going on, well, then all of a sudden you, you, you don't go under the social contract like everyone else does and you are kind of a pariah. Right. Is he talking about something other than property? Like, or because there are things that are, or, or families. He started off by talking about families. There are some things that are individual to a person, be that property or be that social relationships that are unique to one man, one woman, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's different. Is that what he's talking about here? Yes, but we we retain those things only after we submit them to the social contract. You get to have property, but you pay taxes. Oh, we're sure. You have a deed, yeah. right? And if the U.S. government wants to take that property away from you. They usually can, right? With eminent domain, yeah, sure. eminent domain, right? Under under law that is established by everybody else. So you have given up the right to personal property. You cannot just go and stake a claim in the desert and say this is mine and my shotgun says so, right? That's not. I mean, you could, but eventually you would lose that. Fight. You would lose that thing, right? Right. Just like you have the freedom of speech, but you are only returned that freedom by the government after giving up that freedom yourself. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Finally, each man, in giving himself to all, gives himself to nobody. And as there is no associate over whom he does not acquire the same right as he yields over uh, others over himself, he gains an equivalent for everything he loses and an increase of force for the preservation of what he has. So because everyone else is doing the same thing, everyone else has given up their rights too, you don't really lose much, right? That's the contract, is that I have to give up everything, but so do you guys, Right? I, I follow the argument he's making. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, if then we discard from the social compact what is not of its essence, we shall find that it reduces itself to the following terms. Quote, each of us puts his person and all his power in common under the supreme direction of the general will. And in our own, in our corporate capacity, we receive each member as an indivisible, indivisible part of the whole. So we put... Every, his whole power under the common supreme direction and in corporate capacity we re receive um, as an individual part of the whole. Make sense? Yes. Okay, so that seems pretty, like, kind of a duh moment, right? At least for society. I, I guess, I think Graham's point from before stands that these things sound like duh points because we live in Rousseau's world. So again, just like think about what he's argued right there that we as individuals enter into this contract of our own volition, we willingly hand over rights, we're not born into this or required of it, it's located in individualism, and then also everything you just said, it kind of leads naturally to therefore democracy. Well, think about how new democracy is, is like a widespread political structuring. So there's there's a doneness to it because of being in 2022, but remember they tried to burn his books or whatever you said earlier, like this is controversial at the time, because he's proposing huge changes in who gets power and why they get power. It's not because you're born into a royal family that you're kind of by, you know, divine right of king stuff. It's we as people give this power to someone. And there's that, imp there's that implied side of, of, of the coin, which is because we all, everyone's kind of opted into it. As soon as you, everyone sort of realizes they've opted into it, if the thing they've opted into isn't working, then everybody can opt out or... Or you can get everybody together to opt out violently. And, you know, like the French Revolution is what, 30 years away? Exactly, yeah. which is what I was thinking. I mean, right now this seems like, yeah, of course, we're all opting into a thing. And if we don't like it, we can overthrow. But that's, it seems foundational yeah. for the U.S. And I don't, I don't think it was foundational at the time. Man, and the, the, the difficult thing with Rousseau is you can never really tell if he's being serious. Like he's one of the, he's so playful and he's one of those authors that is so, like, he's he, similar to, um, 
um, uh, who's a Dorian Gray? Um, Oscar Wilde. Oscar He's Wilde. kind of got that kind of quality, that gadfly quality to him that you never really can tell if he's saying this with like a wink and a twinkle in his eye and his tongue in his cheek or if he's, or if he's like positing serious philosophical political thought, right? Like he, it's really hard to tell with Rousseau. I mean, this, this is less cheeky. Yeah. It doesn't seem as jokey. I, it seems like, again, it's, it seems like something obvious to us, but if I was a king mm-hmm. and I read this, somebody had published it in my right. place where I had been saying, God chose me to rule you. Mm-hmm. Right? You were made to be ruled. I was made to rule. And that is the contract, mm-hmm. right? Ordained by God. Yeah. That can be overthrown by its people. And then that's where, if you're the king, you're looking around thinking, I got to squelch this, right? Yeah. If all of a sudden what was yesterday a people that felt obliged to follow me because I had been ordained by God to do that, the next day said, hey, we opted into this deal. Right. And the moment you don't like our will as a people, you aren't going to be part of it anymore. Yeah. I mean, this is also, it's not completely unprecedented. Like this is... Um, I've been kicking around the idea of doing a Magna Carta episode. Mm-hmm. And even when they signed the Magna Carta, there was this idea of, they called it, they called it sort of historical convention that we've sort of always, we followed the king insofar as the king upholds, I think like ancient customs, quote unquote. And those ancient customs were a lot of sort of what you're talking about. Like, we'll give you this if you give us that. We'll opt into this if you opt into that. If we're all sort of in it together, we'll follow you. So it's not like Rousseau is coming up with this whole cloth. The idea of this social agreement, I think, is, is, is sort of always been in the in – the, is always a thing that's always been in, in the, the background of, of politics or of government. You mean that there are mutual obligations. Yeah. The rulers don't get to do whatever they want to. Yes. And, and even if a tyrant does – and as to the dislike of the people, that's mm-hmm. the end of the tyrant. Um, Rousseau seems to be anchoring it in some sort of idea of rights, which I think mm-hmm. may be new. The it's idea not something of, given by leaders. It's that you have by nature yeah. and that you then submit to a leader as opposed to that leader giving you that right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think you're, I think you're right, Donaldson, that this isn't a new thing. But I, d- I think it depends on where you are. Mm-hmm. I think in some places in the ancient world, the king was the king because he was maybe even a god, right? So you didn't question him. But in other places, say Greece, I mean, Solon was press ganged into being king. He didn't want to be king. Yeah. And he was obliged by the, you know, he had obligations to the people to do certain things. And if they didn't like it, they were going to chuck him. And he knew that. Yeah. And the monarchy in England and the monarchy in France took very different paths with England having its parliament and France having its sort of like God King of Louis the Fourteenth. Right. Yeah, so it would have been a pretty big deal, which Rousseau is going to roll directly into the next section, which is entitled The Sovereign, um, which I imagine as a king would be kind of shocking to read because the sovereign is basically the embodiment of the general will. The sovereign is the body politic, and it cannot oppose upon itself a law which it cannot infringe since it's basically in contract with itself. So it can't say, like, all the people shall do this law because... The sovereign is basically the personification of the unified will. If we as people don't like a law, we can overthrow it, right? And this is, this seems like just sowing the seeds for the French Revolution. Um, I'm trying to think of, uh, maybe it's like prohibition here in the U.S., right? So there was a law imposed upon the people, but the people as a general will just kept drinking, and kind of didn't like it and did what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so eventually that law went away because the law imposed went against the general will of the people. And so the sovereign there is the people. The people are sovereign. And so they can change the law if they need to. So if I was a king and I read that, well, all of a sudden I'm not part of the equation anymore. That wouldn't make me very happy. He does kind of do a little side mention that rulers can kind of be an embodiment of the, of the will so long as they do everything that the will wants and never really put up a fight if, they, if it doesn't. Or you just do it really slowly, right? Like you, if you just sort of all of a sudden say, no one can drink anymore, next, starting today, that's, you know, terrible. But if it was like a slow, if you sort of slowly chipped away so that the body of people like thought that this was their will, and then you're getting into like a social engineering 1984, or, uh, uh, Brave New World kind of thing. But I would contend that that option is open to any member of the body politic. What? Not just the ruler. Like a slow shift of the values of the people. To yeah. win over the general will. To, to win over the general will, right? Your position. That can, that can be done. We've seen huge shifts in the general will in the U.S. Sure. in the past 50, 60 years. Things that you thought were, yeah, we would never come to pass, you know, 50 years ago are sort of a commonplace consensus or whatever. Exactly. And that shift in the general will has not necessarily happened because of what 
the, the people at the top have done. Sure. Right? So that is open to everyone and not just the sovereign, right? The king. Um, let's see. It cannot have any <clears throat> will contrary to the general. Um, one interesting thing is that it can never submit itself to a ruler or to another state because as an embodiment of the will, well, you can never really give away the will of the people. They're always going to will something. And so the moment that they become subject to another kingdom, well, that means the obliteration of the sovereign. There's no sovereign anymore. I, or it kind of continues in rebellion to whatever's happening. I think that it's like it can never sort of sell its will to somebody else or say, you may be sovereign over me because it's just the will of the people. Right. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. This is just, it's such an interesting question. Like when do, when does like a group, a, a, a number population become a people, right? Like, and mm-hmm. I, I don't want, we can, we don't have to go down this trail, but I've been listening to a really long history of, um, of basically the history of, of Israel and Zionism going back to basically before world war one to the modern day. And I'm kind of just after world war one in the history of it. And you know, th- this question of, like, what makes a people is kind of a foundational thing. Like, there are 350 million Americans, or 350 million people living in this section of North America, but you go and talk to people and they would say, I'm an American. Um, and it's just like, when, when he's talking about, like, the social contract that the sovereign, which is this group of people have, um, uh, when does that, like, how does a group of people become a sovereign? Is it all of France? Is it people that, is it just united by language? Is it united by culture? Um, of course, the interesting question with we're talking about Israel, we're talking about the Jews, is you have all these people from all over the world who've come together and who have had like a thousand years of being in this, these disparate places. Anyway, I'm, I, I, we don't want to take, it, take your, your, your uh, um, episode down that line. It's just that idea of um, when does a, the way Rousseau tells it, he makes it sound like each and every individual person has this, this one little say, and then uh, this sort of general movement of the will of the people is what drives politics. But in reality, there's, there's people who have louder voices and bigger sway than other people. And you have, you know, like political commentators and like tastemakers and people like Rousseau who can write a book and it gets really popular. And then all of a sudden he's the, uh, you know, an embodiment of the will of the people when 80% of like rural France probably doesn't think this way. I don't know. Yeah. I, I and think yet 30 years later you have a revolution. I think that's fine. Having people g- do these big sways. What gets me is the people who do not want to opt into the social contract and yet cannot escape it. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Like maybe I don't like this country, but I don't have the means or the wherewithal to leave this country. Right. I don't want to be a part of this social contract, but I cannot escape it. So how does that factor in? Right, because later he's going to talk about law, and I don't think we're going to get to it in this this episode. But how law and even the right to kill the members mm-hmm. comes into play? How does that work? And it's all sort of based on that they that you have entered into the social contract, even if you are end up as a criminal. Right, you've entered into that contract to to stop criminals from assaulting you, even if you will eventually become yeah. a criminal yourself. But what about the kid who's born in that country? Doesn't necessarily want to be a part of it. I mean, there are these. Is weird, that is that where the Hell's Angels come from? Maybe, like, is that what we're maybe about? you get these subcultures. There are all these. There are also these weird social um, experiments um, where there are sections of countries or or sections of cities that get parceled off that have different laws and are a lot more like permissive than the rest of the city. There's this island off the uh, uh, in Denmark. Uh, I think it's called Christian Christians Land or something like that. <laughs> and um, it's, on the nose. It's no, no, no. And it's basically like. It, it, it came out of the uh, really wanting to liberalize drug use in like the 60s and 70s. Oh, so it's a misnomer. And so then that island is is com- is like completely has completely different drug laws than the rest of Denmark, and it's kind of this like wild west place in the middle of this city, and it was it's kind of like this place where you go if you want to. I mean, I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but it, and I, I don't know too much about it. I just remember when I was visiting it and talking to people, it. It felt like the place where if you really wanted to go live a little more free and a little less under society, you can go live on this on this place. But, you know, buckle up for maybe some injustice done to you because you're not going to have the same societal mm. support than you would on the mainland. Like kind Texas. Of thing. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so but yeah, should come should communities have like places where people can go to opt out 
if they want to. I don't know. It's interesting. I don't know. So more more about the sovereign. It is since it's formed wholly of the individuals who compose it, it neither has nor can have any interest contrary to theirs. And consequently, the sovereign power need give no guarantee to its subjects because it's impossible for the body to wish to hurt all its members. So there again is that sort of, it cannot have a will that hurts its subjects or contrary to the, that of the people, right? So the moment the king kind of says, I want to do something that the people don't want me to do, well, he is now sort of broken from the sovereign will. And I, man, if I was looking to host a revolution, this would be kind of the kind of stuff that I would base it on right here. Sure. Um, man can have an, oh, so, so this is interesting. Man can have an individual will that is contrary to the general. So this doesn't quite hmm. address what happens if you don't want to opt into the contract, but it does talk about how we can have an individual will that's contrary. So for, so therefore, in order that the social compact may not be an empty formula that tacitly includes the undertaking, which alone can give force to the rest, that whoever refuses to obey the general will shall be compelled to do so by the whole body. This means nothing less than he, than he will be forced to be free, for this is the condition which, by giving each citizen to his country, secures him against all personal dependence. So basically, if so you don't... It's a terrifying doublespeak. Forced to be free. Well, isn't it? Yeah. And what if I'm throwing you in jail? Right. Am I there for forcing you to be free? Or maybe was I just forcing you to be free before and now... You're getting, yeah. You're getting your comeuppance for that, those few years of freedom you enjoyed sure. under and the he, social contract. He's, probably, he's primarily moving things one step forward. So if he's moving... Even what's hard to think about is that he's writing in a time pre-nations. So like... Um, Italy isn't established at this point. It's another hundred years. France, I think, is another hundred years. There's a kingdom of France, but not a French state in the way that we understand it today. So um, he's moving things one step forward from kingdoms to kind of pure democracy, I guess you might say. Obviously, that goes wrong in the French Revolution, but he's not, he obviously is like um, ignoring like the rights of people that can get trampled by majorities, right? Mm -hmm. by, by his rules, 51% of a population could dictate everything. And that's what he means by forcing you into freedom. Yeah. Either 51% or like the loud, influential, and slightly more powerful 30%, right? Depends how they... Yeah. Because I guess he's not talking about voting, so I don't mm -hmm. know how they determine the will. Okay, so that's that's interesting. I don't. I, I forget where this comes up. I'll, I'll just say it now, and then we come we come to it, we can skip it. Oh, it's like if Twitter wins. If it's, it's like if, if the, it's the loudest. There's like, you know, Twitter represents like, you know, this small intellectual segment of the population, but wields, you know, persuasive power in terms of policy. The, the fun thing is that he says the general will is basically a weird math equation where <laughs> I'm serious, where if you have people that are extreme on either side, they will essentially cancel each other out. Perfect. Oh, there you go. So, Excellent. so, so taking away the negatives and the positives, right? The people who are like, yes, yeah, slavery. And the people who are like, well, I guess we won that one. Yeah. Yeah. General will. <laughs> But like, let's see something else like uh, taxes. So like tax everything all the time and no taxes ever. Well, they'll kind of cancel each other out. And then eventually the, the will will end up sort of somewhere in the middle. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's this big balancing act. And if the whole will, right, taking away the negatives and the positives, right, the negative one and the, po and the, and the one eventually gets to zero. Well, that whole thing can shift slowly, mm -hmm. but the whole people has to get there. Even if there are a few loud and maybe the loud voices on the edge can kind of exert that pull, but the general will is the equation. So is this like a moral majority argument? Is that what he's kind of making? No. Because uh, again, maybe I'm misunderstanding your comment because the, the extremeness with which you feel one way or another dictates like your vote essentially. Mm -hmm. So if you feel, if, if you really, really hate a policy, that's a, a bigger vote. This is, he's writing around the same time as Jeremy Bentham, which, which is where we get utilitarianism which was meant to be like a science of happiness and like moral decision-making. And that's what Rousseau's trying to do too. He's trying to quantify the general will isn't just, you know, one person, one vote. It's like, um, again, extremity of how much you feel that this is the right position on both sides. Right. Isn't that what you're describing right there? Yeah. That's, that's what early utilitarianism is. It's not just, um, most satisfaction for the most people. It's, it's weighted by like how much a decision impacts you. Again, there's, there's a whole math behind it that maybe is interesting, but obviously it's not the purview of this episode. Yeah. He says you, you'll end up somewhere in the middle, right. taking all the extremes into account. Yeah. He does have things to say about when factions arise and that can cause problems, but we're not quite there yet. Um, 
now we have a, this weird inter, interlude where he basically says that society is great for man. And this is where, what, mm. the, which is why I kind of wondered about when you said it was better for man to live free and all this, these stupid ideals. This section seems to say that society is incredibly good for man. And he doesn't really give any reasoning behind it. He just says this is what's happening, at least as far as I can tell. So um, the passage from the state of, natu- state of nature to the civil state produces a very remarkable change in man by substituting justice for instinct in his conduct and giving his actions the morality they had formerly lacked. So, right? Okay. Yeah. Used to be instinct, now it's justice and morality. So I guess he is sort of making a moral argument here that society establishes morals. Yeah. Then only, when the voice of duty takes the place of physical impulses and the right of appetite, does man, who so far had considered only himself, find that he is forced to act on different principles and to consult his reason before listening to his inclinations. Although in this state, he deprives himself of some advantage which he got from nature, he gains in return others so great, his faculties are so stimulated and developed, his ideas so extended, his feelings so ennobled, and his whole soul so uplifted that did not the abuses of this new condition often degrade him below that which he left, he would be bound to bless continually the happy moment which took him from it forever, and instead of a stupid and unimaginative animal, made him an intelligent being and man. And that's that's high praise for society. Okay, fair enough. Right? I don't know. Kind of. Again, he seems to have multiple opinions on it. He seems to think you are definitely giving something up by being a part of this society, but you do gain these benefits. Just wait until society starts asking you to do things you really don't want to do, though. Like, yeah. you know, he... Um, anyway, yeah. And then the, if you can opt out and there's no obligation, like why, unless the general will is commanding you to go to war and that's the reason you should, you just, ha- you just haven't really answered the question of why does the general will matter other than it's the one thing that holds us together. Well, I think he, he hinted on it in there. It sounds like the whole romantic project of making morality reasonable. He says... Um, who so far had considered only himself, finds that he is forced to act on different principles and to consult his reason before listening to his inclinations. So it sounds like he is there trying to essentially say morality is reasonable, right? Mm -hmm. So he has to think of his reason rather than just listening to his instinct, and that, therefore, is what has ennobled him so much. That's pretty pretty high praise. And that's, that's, it's it's a short section, right? The part on the sovereign is a short short section. Well, this is the part. It just says uh, this part is called the civil state, right? Man in his civil state. So sovereign, civil state. The next section is property. And it seems like we have just enough time to sort of tackle it and then move on, which is great. I think that's, yeah, that's the end of book one. Guys. We did look it. at us. Oh, man. We're professionals. Just nailed we made it. it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So each individual gives himself entirely to the social contract, including all goods he possesses. This makes his possessions even more legitimate since the force of the state makes it stronger and irrevocable, right? You give all your property, right? Donaldson, you've got property. Now I've got property, and I have submitted it to the state that it makes it more protected, right? So not only is it established because I am there and I want to defend it, and maybe I have a big stick and I can fend people off of it, but the state, and therefore every other member of society, is also affirming my property and saying, right. yes, you live here, and I do not. You got the deed with the seal of the state of Texas on it? Exactly. Nobody can take that from you. Well, the bank has it oh, until yeah. I pay my loan That's off. Right. But yeah. Did you know they're actually, you actually like get the deed? I got one yeah, in the yeah, mail for true. my car. Yeah. You yep. get the deed to your house, too, or your apartment. It's odd. Oh, I didn't know yeah. that was a thing. Yeah. I got like the it came a little it. envelope. They don't, yeah, the bank owns it. So. Yeah, the bank totally owns it. If you buy land in Texas, they give you a hat and boots. They don't. No, they don't. That's not true. That would be cool, though. <laughs> the general will. You get a gun. Head, they just, like, give you like a like a, hat boots, like a six like shooter. The Texas starter pack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a <laughs> Yeti cooler, a six shooter, and a jet ski. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For the weekends. Okay. So, uh, real property. Um, he says the right of the first occupier becomes a right only when the right of property has been established. So he's referencing here the right of the first occupier. Basically, first come, first serve on land. You there? Nobody else can go there. In establishing your property, you are respecting what does not belong to yourself. You're saying, I get this, but I also don't get everybody else's property. Um, The following conditions are there for a first occupier over a plot of ground. So he says, here's what's required for someone to like move in and say, this is mine. One, 
the land must not yet be inhabited. Fair enough. You're not the first Makes occupier sense. if it's already occupied, right? Number two, a man must occupy only what he needs for his subsistence. And number three, possession must be taken by labor and cultivation. So when you move into a piece of land, can't have somebody on it, you can't take more than your share, and you can't just say, like, this is mine, and then let it degrade. You have to take over and actually, like, improve, cultivate, and put your labor into well, it. Well, let's say I have 100 acres, but, like, 20 of them I, I haven't even walked on. Like, they're just somewhere off on the edge of my property. And I don't I have, you know, it's just big property, I, and I have my cattle on 50 of those acres. And then I live on other acres, and then 20 acres I don't even do anything with. Could AJ, could, AJ, could you then come and set up shop? And say, this is mine, and cultivate it. And say, you don't need this, Donaldson. This isn't, you don't need this for your own, for your own sustenance. You, you're not even using it. Uh, and since I'm using it, I can use the first right, the first dweller rules and take it. So, uh, quick note, I think philosophically it would have, have to be established by the state and supported by the state uh-huh. and say, look, th- like you have to actually use the land or we're going to take it back. Oh, man. And secondly, in Texas, yes, <laughs> you can. If I go and improve a property after 10 years, it's mine. If no one throws a fit about it. That's true. There is that obscure law in Texas. Well, obscure and also that it's what is the problem, are the main problem for Veritas right now in the, in the property down at the edge of our thing. Because we, oh yeah, because there was a line, we didn't there was realize a line. He it. Built, he built a fence further in on our property. And then since we didn't lodge a complaint early enough, that essentially becomes his. Well, I think what had happened is the guy before him did that and then he sold it to another guy, and the other guy thought he was buying a larger parcel, and it's just this whole kerfuffle. But part of that is the, oh, what do they call it? The um, Squatter's rights. Is, that what is it squatter's rights? Is that what it is? Um, but yeah, if you improve a property, build a fence around it, and you know, put a little house on there, if no one challenges you for 10 years, cool. in Texas, it's yours. No wonder the French Revolution happened. Why? why? I'm just, all these, uh, the social contract's confusing. It is confusing. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's property. So property is established by the whole group, essentially. So use or lose it is is this property law. (laughs) Yeah, use use or to lose it. And you have to also say, like, relinquish control of everybody else's property when you say, this this one is mine. So this probably comes, yeah, uh, uh, this probably comes uh, right up, gets stuck in the craw of the king. King's probably not too thrilled about this chapter. Because he doesn't own. Because he owns it all. Or he's like, you know, he's more than he he's more than he can use. Yeah, probably, right? He's and he's also not probably not the one laboring upon it. Sure, would be my guess. Yeah, he although gets, he's hiring people to labor on it, so that one's probably okay. He get his like pantyhose all all, sorry, all sullied. Although everyone had pantyhose. No oh, fair and, point. And like looking back, it was kind of a look. It was it was it was a whole look. Like the whole like big poofy pants, yeah. the donut pants with the, the with the tights. That was yeah. I don't know. You can dress that way if you want to, Adrian. But if you, if, but the social convention isn't, know, isn't tending right. that way. The, yeah. the will, the social will, is it is not that I wear donut pants. You cargo, shape the general will. Cargo shorts and t-shirts. That's what, that's what society Car- wants. Cargo shorts and t-shirts. <laughs> yeah. Is are cargo shorts back? No, I hope no. not. I don't think so. I think so. they are back. Are no. they? Yeah. yeah. It's an embarrassment. As phones get bigger, you need to you know pockets to put them in. I know. Have you seen those like halfway between tablet and phone phones? Where it looks like you're talking into a slice of bread. It's like, yeah, they're huge. They're like that big. Hmm. Isn't it a phablet, a phone tablet? Oh, that's, know, a, ooh, that's a terrible word. That's, that's really bad. Name. Okay. Well, it's so better than tone, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> or tablone. Tablone sounds like a sandwich. Oh, or a chocolate bar. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a Toblerone. No. Is a tablone just like a half of one? Mm-hmm. Okay. These jokes are bad. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's. Oh, is that, is, we, that, is, that, I mean, is that it? I, I like to call it there. That's back, that's, that's, that's book, book one. one? Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, what's, uh, how many books are there? Um, I think four. Are you coming back to two through four? Yeah, because I think it's going to get even more interesting as we go. Because he's going to talk about how, in book two, so a little preview, he's going to talk about how laws apply and how, like, how that works. How laws come into the general will, especially if, um, yeah, if certain people don't want those laws. We didn't talk much about factions today. We'll have to come back to it. So what's my takeaway? What's my, like, book one takeaway from Rousseau? That the, the sovereign is the sort of amorphous consensus will of the people. And that to be a participant, you have to alienate all of your rights. Yeah. 
only to return, only to like receive them again. I feel like that's sovereign. setting up a pretty big tension. Like what happens when I've submitted all of my rights to the state and for some reason, and then I feel like, you know, the conscientious objectors to a war or, or what happens when what the, what the state is demanding of you butts up against convictions. That's a great question. Yeah. Well, especially when it's the will of the entire people, oh, right? Gosh. When the whole people mm-hmm. says that we don't like what the, what the state is doing, how, you know, what is the response? I haven't heard Rousseau's response to that yet. He, he has said that with, when factions arise, it is mm-hmm. really dangerous because mm-hmm. then it's not one, one vote per member. It's one vote per faction. Yeah. Or really, if one of the factions is bigger than all others, it's one vote. Gotcha. Which feels weird in the U.S. where we have a lot of sort of, I don't know, f- factions. But I don't, I don't know if it's the same as like a, a people living in a different area that want a different set of rules and live by a different convention. We're all still sort of under the same convention. Mm-hmm. We just have different opinions on it. Gotcha. So I think, we're, I think we're okay as far as factions go, but, you know. Interesting. I guess we'll find out when we come back to it. Yep. This has been Classical Stuff You Should Know. Thank you all for listening. You can find us on Twitter at Classical Stuff, C-L-S-S-C-A-L Stuff. You can email us at theguys at classicalstuff.net. If you want to hear more from us, you can find us on Patreon, patreon.com slash classical stuff. We're going to continue this conversation in an, in an in-between episode, which we record after every one of our episodes, starting somewhere around, I think 120 is when we started. So there are a mm. bunch of them if you want to go listen to those. It's back whenever the patronage episode was. Mm, that was thing. When we started it. All right. Thank you all. I think it's everything. Did I forget anything? Okay. Thank you all for listening. For Graham, AJ Thomas, we are signing off. We will talk with you soon. Bye. Cheers. Cheers.